Leclerc. It's Leclerc. Charles Leclerc. Welcome to Negative Camber, the motorsport show brought to you by Pro Karts Race Centre. Far enough back, he's going to make the lunge down the inside. The ultimate pit stop. The safety car is coming in. Fueling your passion for motorsport. With an emotional moment well that means everything. All of the latest results, analysis and interviews. Roll the drivers on to the final lap of this race. I'm Jamie Lemura motorsport enthusiast, historian and media presenter. And I'm Lee Harrison, motorsport professional, Sprint Master Karts race driver and Formula One alumni. Welcome to Negative Camber Season 4. We are here, we are back. We finally made it at a time where I didn't actually think we would. <laughs> and uh, for Season 4, back again is my co-driver, Lee Harrison. G'day, mate. How are you going? Look, I'm going okay. I'm here. I'm alive. Uh, yeah, and I'm awake. So that's that's probably one of the, the best things about this at the moment. Well, we can chalk that down as miraculous, considering you have the best sunglass tan I've seen in a while. <laughs> but um, that was AKC induced, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. For five days in the sun, uh, it's actually not too bad. Like just my nose, really. My hands, my arms are a bit burned as well, but the legs missed out this time. So uh, I'm gonna have to up my game for the next round. We'll touch on that a little bit later on in the show, but um, I'll probably just start by saying that um, this is the new norm for us. Uh, we actually uh, called it a day with Radio Taliun at the beginning of the year, and I suppose it's probably a good segment to thank Mark and uh, Dina Mussolino and the team at the station for the three years of allowing us to, I wouldn't say rule their airwaves, but to be in their studio and for us to do our thing. And we wouldn't be in the position that we're in right now if it wasn't for Mark's input and also the station's help to get us to that next level. So uh, we've kind of gone back to our roots now, which is uh, certainly more of a, I suppose for us, it's more of a chance to have our normal voice but also include a visual medium in all this too so um yeah we'll uh, we'll find our groove as the weeks go on but um yeah the new norm hey, absolutely it's pretty pretty exciting time uh to go off on our own two feet again but uh it's yeah testament to mark and the, to the team for building us up and uh giving us the platform to and the tools to go and do this ourselves but um looking forward to what season four has in store and it's just going to probably allow us the freedom to be a little bit more fle uh, flexible i guess with uh when we record <laughs> and how we record and um you know maybe we're a bit more agile in in the responses we can give and instead of making everyone wait a couple of weeks before they hear our lovely voices again we can uh, be a bit more responsive to the action that's happening in the world around us Mm. Speaking of action, before I touch on asking you about your off-season, I need to show you what happened in my off-season. Project Ray. Let, can you make a drum roll, please? Behold. Cue the vomit. Project Ray. How good is this? The only good thing about that is the fact that my dad did a good paint job. The lines are crisp. He did it absolutely amazing like i cried when i picked this whole i'm well aware i'm well I aware yes so for those that play at home uh that is a combination of uh an era of mark scaife racing between gibson motorsport and hrt so we've done a bit of a crossover between 96 99 and 2003 and obviously just put a little bit of jl on there and the ray came up trumps so uh I haven't had a chance to actually get out on the racetrack yet, but I will be soon. I've got too much on my plate at the moment to even contemplate thinking about. But um, that was probably the highlight outside of spending some time with the kids and the wife and, and having some much-needed R&R. &R. But uh, what about you? What did you get up to? Since when? <laughs> I feel like I haven't stopped since we last recorded. You know, I had a few days off. With... I, can't even... <laughs> I can't even remember when we last recorded. Yeah, it was before Christmas. Was it was... Jesus. Um yeah, spent some time with the kids and, and Shay up at the river and, and the rest of the family. But uh, apart from that, it's been pretty well all go. I think I had the, the time off between uh, Boxing Day and, and New Year's Day. Um, and apart mm. from that, yeah, we've been flat out. The team's growing, so we've been spending a lot of time at the track. Um, obviously this, uh, this deal with, uh, the AKC has come up. So there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff happening in the background with that, um, yeah, it's just it's a lot of, a lot of sim racing as I'm trying to expand into the 
into the world of streaming with my sim racing and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it's been it's been a busy start to 2024, but uh, it's it's kicking off quite well. Um, yeah, I look forward to what the year's got in front of me. I did note you had turned into a bit of a gaming goob again, like you'd sort of gone back to your childhood and getting a bit bit of a bit of a wizard playing your Sims and stuff. I don't know if uh, again is the right word. I just think it's being more public about it. Um, yeah. Shay will tell you a hundred percent that if uh, if I can get a few moments to jump on the sim, it's definitely going to happen. And uh, yeah, and I think now I'm just being a bit more public about it. So we'll see what the, the opportunity brings with streaming. You know, if, if I'm going to be playing it, I may as well stream it and uh, see if there's any sort of income that can be generated from it. But as well, it brings brings some lighter to negative camber. You know, I've got the cars that I race all painted up with negative camber paint jobs and, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it hopefully brings a few more uh, eyes to the podcast and... Uh, grows our listenership even more yeah and to, speaking of listenerships we know we've had some messages that have popped up on our facebook page and and also i've had people approach me and ask about where we've been and what's been happening and it does feel like an eternity but we are back and um yeah hopefully uh you know as lee said a lot more regular there'll be a visual element to this as well so uh thank you all for your patience and uh, look, we start really when the motor racing season starts, and it's only really been sort of the last couple of weeks, to be yeah. honest, that we've really had something to talk about. So um, outside of obviously things that have been happening in the F1 world in the, over within the last month. Yeah. So yeah, huge shout out to Xander who uh, messaged the Negative Camber fa- uh, Instagram page on my birthday and actually asked where we've been because he's been missing us on his long road trips uh, around the country. So uh, Xander, we're back. Um, thanks for listening in and thanks for checking in on us to make sure that we're still alive and still still recording but yeah like jamie said it's uh, a bit of a downturn in the action over christmas and into the early new year so we kind of wait until uh, there's a bit of action to talk about and now with f1 preseason testing wrapping up just yesterday it seems like the perfect time you know we've got the v8s back for round one this afternoon as well and Australian Karting Championships has concluded the first round this weekend as well. So there's a fair bit to talk about and uh, now seems like the right time to jump back on and and start recording some action. Well, we've got a plethora of stuff to cover, um, but I wanted to get started first, Maverick, by finding out how you got this gig at Top Gun for the AKC and how the opportunity came about and what it includes moving forward. Yeah, so I've known Troy for a long time, um, probably since... Um, I was mechanicing and crewing for Todd, actually. Um, so way back, whatever year that was, maybe 10, 15 years ago. So I, I knew Troy quite well because he had a couple of drivers that we were racing against quite hard um, week in, week out on on the national scene. So um, yeah, I've known Troy since since then and uh, I've always stayed in touch. And every time I see him at a, at a you know, decent race meeting, I always make sure to say hello and um, catch up with him and see how he's doing and, and all the rest of it. So did some work with him last year as well on the Junior Sprockets program out at Bolivar. Um, just doing some, you know, you know, general driver coaching and stuff like that for the newcomers to the sport. And yeah, I guess he found himself in a a position this year where he's got a lot more drivers on and his regular data guy and driver coach, uh, Cody Bruchinski, is also racing in the uh, Aussie Racing Car Series. Um, so can't make every round. Um, Mm -hmm. so then, yeah, Troy decided that he needed another person, um, wanted someone that could do all of the rounds as well. Um, as well as Cody being there on, on three out of the five rounds. Um, and I guess, yeah, I was the, the first person that he sort of thought of when that opportunity arose. So he gave me a bell, uh, it was probably maybe about six weeks ago now, just after, just after Christmas, I guess it was, um, maybe just into the early new year and just asked if it was something that I'd be interested in. And uh, at that time, um, Cody and I hadn't worked out what we were doing in terms of racing for the Soddy Kart. Um, You know, we might have done Bolivar. We were still um umming and ah ahring. But yeah, I uh, I committed to to the thing with Troy and uh, it didn't have any bearing on the fact of whether Cody raced this weekend or not. If if Cody raced, I would have still pit crewed for Cody and um, we would have been you know, racing Cody out of the Top Gun team as well because that was that was an offer that was on the table. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's yeah a full year deal. I'll be with Troy for all of the uh, AKC rounds, and um, yeah, if, if he decides that he wants me at any other rounds, then uh, yeah, we'll we'll 
cross that bridge when we come to it. You know, if they decide to do anything else as a team, uh, like the summer series later on in the year or anything like that. But yeah, it's um, quite quite a nice little little deal to be on, and uh, I'm looking forward to helping the team out where I can and. Um, yeah, getting to know all the drivers and, and dipping my toes in and going out and learning a bit more about some new tracks as well. So we'll go to Coffs, we'll go to Emerald. They're two tracks that I haven't been to and uh, yeah, really looking forward to get to those tracks. Yeah, cool. Sounds like a good opportunity, mate, and right up your alley. I mean, your, your driver coaching has really sort of been your core focus, I'd say, for over the last six months, it'd probably be fair to say. And like to a point, I would guess that's the reason why you've cut back on your own personal racing. Yeah. Uh, or has there been other reasons behind it? Oh, look, we've got a lot of people with our team now as well. Like we're running sort of seven or eight people at um, at a club day at Bolivar now. So it's kind of hard to – and I could do it. Like, you know, we don't really, um, you know, spend a lot of time working on the Sprint Master when we race it. But I just feel like if I'm on track and I'm focusing on my own program as well, I'm not giving my all to the customers and stuff like that. So – I will still have some sort of a racing program this year. It's just what that looks like. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that I do will revolve around what our customers want to do. Um, so, you know, if if Cody wants to go and race country series or some of our juniors want to go and race country series, then, then we'll go and do that. And then I'll have to miss out on a club day at Bolivar or, you know, a four SS festival state cup meeting or something like that. So, um, I think I'll still be racing the big race meetings and there's definitely some, stuff that is in the works for a couple of the bigger race meetings as well but um yeah it's just the driver coaching and looking after the team um for pro karts race center has definitely taken a a big of a a bit of a bigger step this year so we'll um be focusing more on that and and that's where i'll spend most of my time yeah fair enough man that's and that's good i mean all all credit to you and the fact that you've got your, your foot in a in a spot like Top Gun, I mean, it's only really upwards. You know, if if there's going to be um, drivers or juniors that are going to flourish under your guidance when you're there, then all that's going to mean really is it's just going to enhance your reputation amongst the crew and that could potentially lead to bigger teams tapping on the shoulder. So, look, I'm not really too fussed about bigger teams, to be honest. Like, uh, the working relationship with Troy is really nice and, um, yeah, I just, I'm quite, quite happy doing that. So, uh, I'm not, even looking at another team or another opportunity, uh, just focusing on making sure that we make sure that Top Gun Racing uh, has the best year that it can have. And unfortunately, it wasn't the best start to the year this this weekend, but we will move on to tracks that the drivers are way more familiar with now. And um, yeah, hopefully we can, we can build on that. Tell you what, given some of the video footage that I've seen over the last 24 hours, there's probably a good chunk of drivers that probably need some driver coaching in terms of how to get through a race and how to actually last a race. But we will cover that later on because some of it is just head scratching shit, man. (laughs) I swear it is. (sighs) Without sounding harsh, because we've all been there, we've all made fuck ups, but dumb drivers really do some dumb things sometimes. So, yes, on to that later on. uh, Yeah, been saying how the driving standard at AKC level was probably some of the worst in the country and it was brought to the front forefront yet again this weekend. The thing I find fascinating, mate, and now we'll probably diverge into that topic, is Southerns have gone to great lengths to reprofile that corner. So it's meant to be technically a little bit wider. The radius has changed a little bit, etc. They They do their track walks. They do their practice sessions. They do their qualifying sessions. But for God's sake, how hard is it to actually be able to navigate? Now, if you get 32 four-stroke drivers of varying degrees of difficulty, Right now, granted it's four-stroke, right? Granted the carts are slower, but if they can get through that corner without actually, you know, causing any strife, we had thirty-six think, too, by the way. Yeah. Oh, thirty-six. Okay, even better. So if you could, if you think thirty-six drivers of varying degrees have the capacity to get through that corner, and the country's best drivers struggle to do that on a repeated basis to a point where you've got fifteen carts sitting on the infield waiting to be picked up, I mean, what, what's going on? Seriously, I mean, if you if you want to compare apples with apples, we're probably not doing that. Um, comparing thirty six four stroke drivers going into a ninety minute enduro in turn one, probably a little bit different to forty of Australia's best and fastest drivers going into turn one of a ten lap race. So 
you know, you can you can make up a fair few positions in the turn one of a ten lap race if the cards play your play your way, but you can also lose a hell of a lot. So we were unfortunately one of our drivers, Riley Grande in Cadet Twelve, was the unfortunate uh, participant in the twenty go kart pile up in Cadet Twelve, and we bent a chassis <laughs> and all the rest of it. So we had to swap swap chassis, which put us rear field for the next heat. We're coming out of P30 for the next heat. And so we, yeah, the advice from myself and from Troy was just don't even go into turn one. Just roll off at the middle of the straight and roll through there and let the crash happen in front of you. So he went from 30th to 10th in the first corner of lap one in the next race because they all pile drived each other again. So, um, yeah, like I said, comparing apples and apples, 36 four stroke drivers in the front of a 90 minute enduro, probably a little bit different to, you know, 35 kids or preteens or whatever you want to call them uh going in there at the start of a 10 lap race the racing today was a lot better uh whether that had anything to do with the longer races uh, i don't know um but they were all getting a pretty solid talking to on the on the grid before they went out and maybe they maybe that's what they needed to do from uh from yesterday morning as an official just pull them all upside and say listen turn one's a tight one we don't want any carts ending up in the gravel so it didn't alleviate all of the turn one chaos but it was significantly better today than it was yesterday yeah well and that's what i mean like i I suppose yeah i know my example is a bit not quite apples with apples but it's more the volume of carts that are getting through that there's a chance that there's going to be some carnage yeah and so yeah i think exactly what you did what you did and what the marshals did today because clearly it had an impact you know, you were using your, your common sense and the fact that you've been there, done that. And the stewards have cl- clearly pulled them up and said, no more shenanigans. So I think that's what they, they have to do, especially with the juniors. The adults you can't, and the seniors, you probably think a bit more common sense. But for the juniors, actually, yeah, probably not. But um, yeah, just like, yeah, there's got to be a greater focus on it, uh, in my opinion, anyway. But let's, off, let's remove the focus of that. Lewis. Ferrari, F1, man, that didn't see it coming. No, I, I did not see that coming at all. And, um, I mean, there was talk about it. What We, we covered it last year, about, about halfway through the season. There was a rumour. I'm like, eh, no way, no chance in hell. And then, bang, there you go. So just to see your piss burn next year, I pray victory. I pray victory. Just to see Lewis with the Tifosi in front of everyone, Max in second. Oh. That'd be a dream. That'd be a dream. And that's a, but I'd want to see your facial expression as well. That's exactly what it's going to stay. It's going to stay a dream because it's not going to happen. I mean, how can your team that puts a video up of them saying poetry in motion or whatever and f- showing one of their greatest pit stops ever that they put up on Facebook and it, it's getting a wheel stuck and they bloody hell, they can't, even, they can't even do a promotional pit stop, right? And then they can't even have the media person pick that up while they're sending it around the whole of the factory waiting for, for guidance on whether to post it or not. Dude, well, you, love is blind. You have, <laughs> love is blind. Yeah, you your team have so much that Lewis Hamilton can't fix. It's ridiculous. But no, like do, we said, like hit, it's yeah. it's a big big deal. Uh, like ten billion dollars worth of uh, stock straight into Ferrari overnight once they announced that it was actually happening. So for them, it's already paid off. They've paid off their decision to hire Lewis. They could pay him two hundred million dollars a year for the next fifteen years, and it would still be you know profitable for them. So um, he's they're both like we've said before. Both uh, both teams are going to have pressure like they've never had pressure before lewis is going to have pressure on him to turn ferrari around and ferrari are going to have pressure on themselves to provide lewis with the car and the tools and the capability to go and win a world championship yeah look absolutely and and i think for me the the thing i take away from it is that it was a power move and clearly lewis has seen something or seen some things that ferrari have put forward to him so the word is and the story that i've read um, was that Elkin, John Elkin, who owns the whole group uh, of the Anelli family, has rung Lewis, and he's rung Lewis on multiple occasions, and they've actually struck, struck up a personal friendship. And Elkin's actually laid all his cards on the table this time and said, right, this is what we've got planned, this is what we're doing, this is what our engine looks like, and obviously whatever th- other things they've got in the pipeline. And that's actually perked Lewis up to say, you know what? I think I might might consider this. And so obviously one thing's led to another. He's also had a really good working relationship previously with Freddie Vasseur. 
And then, of course, there's the talk of Carlos having a pre-contract with Audi in the background too. And I was having a good discussion with a couple of mates of mine um, over the off-season or when this news came out. And everyone's like, oh, poor Carlos, poor Carlos. And look, I'm kaleidoscope of emotions on this, as you can imagine. But I think to myself, well, you know what, maybe not necessarily poor Carlos, because you don't know, we don't know what the conversations were on the other side. You know, like we don't know what Carlos's view is. Carlos is probably saying, well, you know what, I'm actually tired of playing second fiddle to Charles. I think I'm ready to leave my own team. And maybe the so fact that he's got something with Audi as well, he's like, I actually don't really mind too much at all. Like he's going to go and be the senior driver for Audi as they come into Formula One. Um, so he's got that working in the background for him as well. So maybe, you know, we, we haven't actually heard from Carlos as to what he thinks about the whole situation at all. So it'll be interesting to mm. hear his take as the season progresses. Well, that would lead me to think that if it's not Audi, he's already got something lined up and he's more than comfortable um, because he hasn't played. He's been very classy about the whole thing, like even in, in Italian interviews or with the Italian media. He's often said, you know, I'm concentrating on this year. I'm doing it for the Tifosi, et cetera, et cetera. He's played the the right cards at the right time. Um, but um, he makes a good go-kart too. That CS55 by Tony Kart is a thing of beauty, as you well know. But From your um, eyes. Oh, it's, it's glorious. <laughs> Absolutely glorious. And um, But for Elkin to make that move uh, and for really Lewis to say, right, if I'm going to actually drive for Ferrari, now's the time. There, I don't know. I, I, there's there's another twist somewhere. I don't know what it is. I'm not 100% what, sure what this is, but I would not be surprised if somewhere along the line, especially with all the shenanigans that's happening with Red Bull at the moment, which we'll touch on shortly, between the power play between Horner and uh, Helmut Marco, that Newey goes to Ferrari as chief designer in the next 12 to 24 months because that would be the thing that would really entice Lewis to make the shift from Mercedes. Yeah, it has to be. The, the thing like with the Red Bull and stuff didn't happen before Lewis made his signature uh, known about Ferrari. So unless there was already some rumblings in the background that the Ferrari, the Formula One paddock knew before uh, hmm. before it broke covers to the media, um, then I don't think that's played into Lewis's hands. But anyway, maybe the stars are lining and everything falling into place if something does happen with with Christian and then uh, Newey decides to leave. I think he still has unfinished business like you, we've read before. He wants to go to Ferrari and, and build a car that they can win with. So um, I don't see that being too far from the from the truth or too far from reality. Mm, mm. You know that video that they put up with the pit stop? I didn't actually notice the tire. Yeah, I didn't notice the change until I actually saw it. I and the, like picked it was it pointed out. Quickly. I was like, oh, that didn't look that didn't look amazing. Uh, but I didn't I didn't post anything about it. I should have because I didn't want to just make too much fun of you. What? Well, enough salt in the wounds from all the shit that you gave me last year. Come on, man. Let me get through pre. Let me get through pre season first. Exactly. Right? I did. I did. I testing. let you. Oh dear, oh dear. But um. Christian Horner and the Red Bull fallout is um, there's a report that circulated around uh, in the Italian papers, I think it was Sky Sports IT, uh, a couple of days ago that Wednesday that they're announcing Red Bull and Christian Horner are parting ways. Now, how much is truth in that? I don't know. Um, and the stories that have kind of arisen over the last couple of weeks about this scenario is quite mixed because at one point it looked like it was an, a, almost an industrial relation dispute between a disgruntled employee and and Christian Horner. And now it's kind of evolved into more of a sexual discrimination type of scenario and, and probably beyond that too. And so they've tried to settle it out of court uh, and um, do you call it the victim? Is that a, probably the right word? The individual um, has said, nope, and they're going to take it all the way. So... Um, but yeah, apparently on Wednesday, it's meant to be announced that he, he's gone. Um, and there's been reports of a power struggle between Helmut Marco and Christian Horner pretty much since D Dietrich Matisic passed. And, um, there's some cer rumors circulating at the moment that that's actually been now become quite political and that Helmut Marco is now driving this as well. So, uh, that's going to play some, uh, it may even be not impact the core team in terms of the functionality. Because if a team's going to fall apart because of Christian Horner, then there's a problem there as well. But it's not going to help, especially with the build-up to round one this week. Yeah, and if he's the glue that sort of holds the team together and all the relationships, you know, like we're, we're just talking about uh, Newey, if, if Horner 
leaves or whatever if, if Newey decides to go as well. Um, what's that do for the relationship with Max Verstappen? Mm. Like where does Max Verstappen end up? Does mm. he start looking for another team? There's a seat available at Mercedes next year that no one's talked about yet. Does he decide that he wants to go to Mercedes and try and, you know, see something that they see there and, and feel Lewis's seat? Like what? What does what does it mean for the rest of the team? You know they've got some really really good people in their in their crew, and um, I think yeah, Christian could be the first domino in a, a range of them that uh, that may fall if if something happens. And at the end of the day, what does that say for Red Bull? Like what what happens to them? You know they've been the dominant team for the last three and looking to be four years. Um, where does where does that leave them? What's well, interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's going to really sort of highlight just how cohesive this team is and how much of an important role Christian Horner does play in that in that squad. You know, like he's been, on many occasions, he's been the peace broker between drivers that have actually been feuding. I mean, we can go as far back as Vettel and Weber, to be honest, and Max and Daniel Ricciardo. And then I guess a couple of years ago with Sergio Perez and Max Verstappen at Monaco. So, you know, with him out of the picture and you've got someone that's highly divisive, like... Helmut Marco, that could actually become the detriment of Red Bull. And has Max then got the capacity to actually pull everyone on his back and say, I've got this and just continue as if it's business as usual. So it's, yeah, it's going to be very, I mean, Wednesday, if it's true, is going to be really critical to see how that all pans out because it's not the build up and the lead in that you want to have into the season opener for sure. No, and definitely not the week before round one. Like um, they've had. A few weeks to get this, uh, they get this sorted, and yeah, leading into round one is is not the time that you want your team principal to be walking out the door and and packing up shops. So, yeah, we'll keep our ears peeled on that one. Mm. Before we get into the the rundown of testing, was there a car or a livery or anything like that that really sort of stuck out to you as numero uno for this year? Yeah, I like the steak livery. I like that it's a different color. I like that it's different compared to the rest of the grid. It stands out. It's striking. Um, that green and black color combination. That's it's pretty good. The only way it would have been better if it was like fluoro orange and and black that color combination. But that not in terms of its speed or the the, the look of it aerodynamically. Um, the look of it physically um, that stood out to me. I'm like I look forward to seeing that car on track and. I'd actually be tempted to buy some of their merchandise as well, just because I think the color combination is a sick one. Valtteri's helmet's pretty cool. He's done the Northern Lights as his helmet for this year, which is you know pretty pretty cool and very clever, considering the color combination. Or at least for testing, um, anyway. They probably have yeah, fifty-five exactly. different helmets this year. <laughs> I still don't. Gone are the days where it was just one helmet and it was iconic and everyone knew who it was and it stayed that way. And I, can't, I actually kind of wish it came, it went back to that. Well, they did try honest. it. They did try and have the the one helmet paint job rule and then the drivers all cracked the shits about it. So then they gave them the rule that they could have, I think it was one or two special helmet liveries for, per year, but they had to be a some sort of um, variation on their on their main helmet paint job. Now we've gone away from that. We're back into having all sorts of different helmets, but I like it. I like seeing what the what the drivers can come up with. I like seeing what they're doing and taking some inspiration myself to some of the helmets that I can help design. Mm. Well, <laughs> leave the helmet designs to Project Ray. The Ray is is a class act. No, if you he, leave, he's, he's, if you leave he's it to my that. dad, he uh, he won't help you out. That's for sure. Just like he's done with yours. Hey, help me out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lescafe now. Yeah. I'm not Lemure anymore. I am Lescafe. We'll see. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. I've got to live up to a name and a reputation now with that helmet. I'll be either flung meat pies at the track or they'll be, <laughs> or I'll get results one way or the other. We'll be in fist um, Yeah, pretty much. Actually, I've got to get out on the track. That's probably a good starting point. Um, you said it, not me. Anyway. Oh, it's the truth. <laughs> My fuck, it's the Jesus. Follow us on socials, join us on our website, negativecamber.co, and be sure to subscribe to the Negative Camber Club for access to exclusive content, episode previews, and special deals from our amazing partners.
ready to turn your karting dreams into reality? Look no further than Pro Karts Race Centre. Imagine hitting the track in the kart of your dreams, a ride that matches your budget and aspirations perfectly. With our pre-loved kart sourcing service, we make it happen. Our experienced team isn't just about mechanics, they're dream builders. We meticulously hand pick each kart, ensuring reliability, performance and sheer exhilaration. Whether you're a seasoned racer looking for an upgrade or a newcomer stepping into the world of karting, we're your pit crew, your partners in racing dreams. Get ready to feel the wind in your hair, the thrill in your heart and the victory at your fingertips with Pro Karts Race Centre, where dreams truly come to life. Visit ProKartsRaceCentre.com.au or pop in for a chat at 30 Research Road, Paraka. ProKarts Race Centre, fueling your dreams, igniting your potential. Um, okay, for me, oh, I tell you what, I, that metallic green on the Aston Martin is pretty nice. I mean, look, the Ferrari I think is gorgeous, but that goes without saying. Um, but that metallic green on the Mercedes, when I was watching testing on TV the other night and was able, sorry, the Mercedes, the Aston Martin, um, geez, that looks good. That looks really, really nice. And, and I think to myself, how can that be a wrap? Like it's, it, it, surely they've spray painted something on it, but no, it's just, you know, really, really high quality wrapping. And, um, that looks really nice. Um, I didn't think much of the racing bulls initially, but then having seen, um, footage of it on TV, I actually think, yeah, it's not too bad. The Visa logo that's on a diagonal that go, follows the line of, of the uh, the radiator intake, I think needs a bit of work. Um, but the blue is actually really, really nice. I mean, um, yeah, I think they're, they're the ones. The steak, yeah, I don't mind the green. I think that's something different. I think we needed that. Kind of reminds me a little bit of, um, and I'm going to cast my mind. Remember the, uh, the Fortis back in the mid-90s? The... the the 40 courses back in 95. Oh, like they were um, green, white, and black or something? Oh, they were fluoro yellow, like fluoro yellow. But they were like, that's where Pedro Diniz, Roberto Marino, they would finish a Grand Prix six laps behind. Like they were miles off. Uh, but that was that real bright. You could tell that they were on the track, yeah. you know, because they get lapped half a dozen <laughs> times, but they stood out. Um, so that's kind of remind me of that color. But um, yeah, I mean, it looks great. They all look great, but they've got to go fast. And I mean, how do you, how do you make a car that is near perfection any better? Will you make a better one? And that's what Rebel have done by the looks of it in testing over the last three days. Yeah, hundred um, percent. They're looking pretty well, unstoppable again. Unfortunately for us fans, it's going to be a pretty pretty boring year. Um, I think they were running heavy fuel loads. Uh, on the last day of testing when everyone else dumped a bit of fuel out and they were running on a harder tire as well, choosing to run on the softer version of the, or the, you know, the version of the tire that's going to be the soft for this race weekend that's coming up this weekend. Whereas other teams went for a tire compound that was a little bit softer, which isn't going to be used. Um, and they were still fast. So uh, it's, yep. yeah, it's looking ominous. I think that Ferrari is probably sitting in second place at the moment as a constructor. Uh, and then I think it's, look, to be fair, I think the running order looks relatively similar to what we ended up with last year. I think then you've got the Mercedes, the McLaren, and then Aston Martin. I think Alpine is struggling. I think Williams, I think that that last four is going to be the the Haas, the Williams, the Alpine. Um and probably the racing bull again, unfortunately. I think the the racing bull will come good towards the end of the year. I think they need time to work on their relationship with uh, with Red Bull um, a little bit more um, to 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 yeah. reap the benefits of that. Yeah, I look on on evidence. You'd say Red Bull by at least a half a second on pole for qualifying. Um, I can only hope given the confidence that a lot of these teams had been coming out with. So Ferrari and Leclerc in particular were very vocal at how much more improved the car is compared to last year, but in particular on the tyre life side. Um, have they revealed all their hand in regards to engine power, engine mode, fuel load, all that sort of stuff? You could say if you, if you, were, if you weren't clued up on the sport and you didn't follow it too much, you'd say, well, how would Max Verstappen and Red Bull be favourite when Ferrari top timesheets in the last day and a half? But you don't read into that, really, do you? Because McLaren are, are quietly confident, although they've sort of said Max is on top. 
uh, Fernando Alonso and Aston Martin have come out saying that all of their CFD uh, figures and facts and stuff that they got in their wind tunnel matches what they've got on the track, so they're really happy. Um, and then um, obviously Red Bull have said, yep, we got everything we needed. Uh, it's ticked all the boxes for us, which is a very, very scary thought if you think about that. So yeah, it's and Haas popped in and out a little bit, but I mean, they came out saying we, they were going to be bottom at the start of the year. So it's hard to predict. I mean, at the end of the day, it's at the end of qualifying is when the bullshit stops. Yeah, I think the thing that scares me the most is that on day one, Red Bull came out and smashed everybody by 1.3 seconds. Mm. If I'm Red Bull, I turn everything off. Like I'm done right there. I'm done. We we go back to work. We've got heavy fuel loads. We've got, you know, we're turning the engine down. We're turning everything down because that's where the teams need to chase to and that was us on our first day of testing we know how much more we've got blah 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 um that's that's scary for me the the scary thing is that they were 1.3 seconds faster on the first day and then nowhere days two and three so Mm. how much have they switched off and how much have they got left to switch back on come this weekend i would have to agree with you and i think that's what freaked everyone out in pit lane where I mean, what Max was, he did maybe what a half a dozen laps and just went bang. Yeah, you know, and I mean, it, and what a way to make an entrance. Well, that no, he <laughs> was, he went bang and then spent the rest of the afternoon just driving around and then waited for somebody to get close to him. He was like seven tenths up for four hours out of the six hour session. Then mm-hmm. Norris got close to him, got to within, or actually pipped him. I think he pipped him for by like a tenth or two. And then he was like, nah, we're not having any of this. And then went out and blew him away by another 1.3 seconds. So that's, yeah, like I said, that's the scary thing for me is that they are that good. Mm, yeah. And that's the thing. Like you do, you put all this effort in, you think you've come across and you, you bridged a gap. You've righted all your wrongs at the end of the year and come out to the new season. And then Red Bull come out and just go bang. Yeah. And you'd be like, oh. I mean, we kind of touched on that towards the middle of last year anyway, yeah, that, you know, they we were so, so dominant that how much of their focus had even been turned towards developing this year's car? How much were they developing last year's car, you know, in this race for the championship that they weren't even really in because they were only there to beat themselves? Um, and I think I think we've just found out. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny you say that because Newey, Adrian Newey was, was quoted as saying that he started work on this year's car really early because they had the wind tunnel constri- uh, constraints that were put onto them at the beginning of last year. Yeah. They had such a massive uh, advantage that they knew that the teams, a lot of the teams were going to copy their design. So he got onto it pretty quickly, which means that he's really had a whole season to focus on this year's car. Yeah. And if, if what you're saying and what we think is going to happen turns out to be the case, well... You know what the the penalty one really didn't do a great deal, but props to them because they, they've done they could afford to do that. Yeah. I think if you go back and listen to our shows last year, that's basically the words that I said that were the penalty's not going to mean nothing. They're so far in front that they're already going to they're going to use all of their allocation of wind tunnel time for this year's car in developing next year's car, and the penalty's not not going to mean nothing to them for for that overspend in two thousand and twenty two. So it looks like. That's what's happened. Um, like I said, they've come out, they've yeah smashed everybody day one, and then been nowhere again days two and three. So I can't wait for qualifying this weekend to work out whether whether it's true or not, and just how big the gap is. And and even then, is that the you know if they go out and pole it by two two three tenths? Is that the gap, or is there still more? Because mm. yeah, like mm. they've got another whole three days of testing, you know, three hours of of free practice to let the competition chase them and they've only got to keep turning the engine up as much as they need to, to keep the competition one tenth behind. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And Honda, Honda have had uh, such an input. They've had more of an input in this year's motor than what they haven't previously. And, um, and again, the scary thing is, is that it's taking forward time or giving forward time for when they come in in 2026. Yeah as well so and that's a, all that intel that red bull will be passing on too yeah and that's a good point to raise as well like you know they've got um one less power unit per team this year um so if red bull can <laughs> race at a reduced power load then uh, they're not asking as much of those power units they're less likely to get uh, penalties grid penalties later on in the year so 
um, yeah, it's, it's ominous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of new segments for F1 this year. Um, none of the cheese that we've had in the past to accommodate for radio. Um, so we're going to go something simple. Our top three predictions for the race. So I'll, I'll let you go first. Yep, okay. Um, Max. Oh, that's tricky. It's tricky. Mm. I don't trust Sergio, no matter how fast the car is, and it's probably going to hurt me. Max, Charles, Oscar Piastri. Ooh, yeah. Okay. You got my first two. I agree with the first two. The third one. Oh. Yeah, I, I reckon Oscar. I, I'd say Oscar. I, I actually, you know, I rate Oscar better than, than I do Lando Norris, which for all the Lando lovers out there, they're going to get all, all, all cock a hoot. But I actually rate him. I really do. I think he's, he has the potential. Now, I, I, remember the Michael Bruchitz interview we did a couple of years ago where Michael rated uh, Daniel Ricciardo was the best driver that Australia has ever produced, irrespective of Alan Jones and Sir Jack and all that sort of stuff. Oscar, I actually think, has the potential in terms of ability to be the best of this current generation. Let's put it that way, and I include Danny Rick in that. Yeah. All right. Which is a bit cool because Danny Rick's a classy driver. But I think on I from what I've seen, there's I would say that he would be he'd be better than Lando Norris in not in no no time. I I would agree. I think um he's already shown that he's a class act by winning Formula Four, Formula Three and Formula Two in back to back to back years. So um yeah, look, I would put him above above Danny Rick at the moment. It's going to be interesting to keep an eye on Danny Rick, actually, like with the pressure mounting on Perez and all the rest of that for that Red Bull seat. Um, yeah, there's a lot to play out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the wild card. Here's a new, a new thing, the wild cards. Which So what this is all about is pink something outside of the box that may or may happen. And it could be really extreme. Uh, or it could be a bit more conservative, but out of outside of the norm, it could be anything that happens on the grid that in, uh, over the whole weekend. So we can't talk it about be... Ferrari messing up the strategy then, because that's not really that's... outside the box, is it? No, Actually, that's, I guess that's my, my wild card is Ferrari pull off a strategically faultless race, including no pit stop mistakes. That's my outside the box Ooh. thing. All right, you know what? my outside the box, a Red Bull double retirement. Yeah, like that's. I mean, it's been it's been done before. It's been done before. We only had to go back to 2022, I think it was, that they both retired, and yeah, one Ferrari. Yeah, but yeah, but their reliability over the last 12 months has been extreme. Yeah, and over over testing, at some point, the odds have to come and where they have a shocker. You know, at some point, it has to happen. Yeah, and what better way than do it at the beginning of the season rather than later on. Look, that point could be 2033 for all we know, but uh, you're right, it does have to happen yeah. eventually. Um, yeah. This this weekend coming, I think it is a very, very big wild card. Like if you were to go to gamble responsibly, but if you were to go to sports bet, they're probably given some pretty long odds on that one. Yeah, I wouldn't like to see the odds of Max actually taking pole in a win though. It'd be pretty uh, short. One, I think. <laughs> dollar one, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Uh, and that was the other one, poll, poll predictor. I mean, goes out saying, doesn't it? I don't think we have to say it. Max Verstappen. Yeah, Max Verstappen. Max Verstappen. All right, that's Formula One. So I think, in a nutshell, I think we're going to be in for. Look, it. it I don't know. I think you could, on the outside it would be predictable season, but I, I got a funny feeling it might be. A, it won't be as landslide and as one sided as last year. The outcome might be the same, but I don't think it's going to be as predictable. I unfortunately think it's going to be more predictable. Like I don't think yeah. I don't see I don't see them losing any race. Well, yeah, you know, as I said before, how do you perfect a car that was nearly unbeatable? You make a better one. Well, and it's some pretty so, radical changes yeah. as well. Like with all of the uh, the side pod design, <laughs> it looks almost like the Mercedes side pod design from from last year. How ironic would that be? Like, like, here they've gone with Mercedes have ditched this zero side pod concept. 
Red Bull come back and apparently they're going to introduce their own zero side pod concept at about the third race. Might be Australia, I think. And can you imagine they make it better? How much <laughs> How much would you laugh if you were Adrian Newey and just walk past them in the paddock and be like, I made something work that you can't? Well, that happens every week, doesn't it's, it? His, his <laughs> stock will go just through the roof. Oh, and when it makes the... You know, can you imagine... Can you imagine the Italians if they actually land Adrian Newey at, at Ferrari? It'll, Let's be honest. They'll go off. Oh, my God. Yeah, it, you know what? It'd be too hard to contain their enthusiasm. And they do tend to jump the shark a little bit too. <laughs> so, yeah, God knows I know. But, um, yeah, I, I think uh, let's see what happens next week and, and let's see how the season unfolds. And before the first three Grand Prix, bang, 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 one after the other. Yeah, how good. So uh, it'll be a rapid fight. Yeah, exactly. And outside of Abu, uh, Abu Dhabi, outside of Bahrain, the next few races are actually in a really good time zone because it's the Asian swing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it'll be... Mm. Good for all of our Australian listeners. Yes, absolutely. Now, supercars. Jesus. What? <laughs> we left the Adelaide 500 and everything was somewhat settled. We crowned a champion. SVG was going to NASCAR. Tim Edwards um, was becoming the, um, I suppose, the technical director of, of supercars. They were off to the USA. They went to the windshield wind tunnel. Uh, and made a whole raft of changes, in particular to the Mustang and the Camaro. Uh, so in layman's terms, uh, a revised front, a front splitter for the Mustang, some revised bodywork uh, across both cars, but in particular with the Mustang around the side skirts, the front end, the front spoiler and the front lip. Uh, they've been able to lift the front central piece under the front grille to allow some airflow to come underneath the car and actually lower the, um, the edges of the front under tray. And so what that was able to do was under brakes when the car would actually um, sort of dip under braking, if we want to put it in simplistic terms, it would actually prevent any understeer uh, to occur, which is what some of the teams were facing, hence tyre issues, etc. as well. They've then been able to reposition the rear wing and they've now matched the dimensions of the rear wing between the Camaro and the Mustang. They've actually moved it back a little bit. They've changed the flip uh, or the lip uh, across the rear boot and what they've also noticed with both cars, and in particular with the Mustang, they've got like a little indentation across the top of the rear window because under load, the windows would be flapping as well. So the overall consensus is, and both cars actually did probably close to about 4,500 kilometers of wind tunnel testing in wind shear. So uh, they got signed off by supercars as aerodynamically spot on. So they tested at very various angles, heights for both cars. They even actually were able to rotate the floor to actually match corner entry from the left and to the right on both cars too. And so what it did do was it gave supercars a whole raft of data, but both homologation teams, a lot of confidence to say aerodynamically it's spot on. So they went to wind shear twice, fixed all that up. And so aerodynamically, there's no, no parity issue there. They're still working on the engine front, in particular with the Ford. So a lot of it's to do with the fact that the Ford Coyote engine is a multi-valve engine, whereas the um, the Chevy engine is a two-valve two pushrod and the multi-cam engine on the Coyote as well. And so the way they've had to tune the Coyote engine up versus the Camaro uh, engine, there's still some disparity in terms of uh, horsepower. But it's very minimal now. Um, what they are going to do is they're going to take it over to a different dyno over the next few weeks. I think between Bathurst, which happened today, and the Formula One Grand Prix, because it's about a month break. And I think what they call it a translucent dyno. I think it's what the terminology is called. And so effectively what it's going to do is for once and for all, it's actually going to show any technical disparity between the motor and they will then shift accordingly. Um, but what we saw at Bathurst over the weekend was far, far better racing compared to where it was even for the 1,000 12 months ago. So credit to supercars. A lot of the teams were really, really chuffed with the aerodynamic um, balance and the level of investment that supercars have actually put into that. So props to them. What we didn't see coming was the fallout between Brody Kostecki and the Erebus team and the mess that's ensued uh, across all of that. So, um, yeah, don't know whether you've heard Anything on the grapevine? I've heard a little bit. I've got to be careful what I say about all that, but um, fair to say, it's it's a mess. Yeah, um, 
Yep. It's it's a mess. Um, again, like you, I've heard heard bits and pieces, but um, due to uh, close associations, I guess it's probably best not to say too much. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's a pretty big mess. I don't, I don't think I don't see Brody coming back to the sport. To be honest, um, yeah, I, 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 which I hope is good news for Todd, who obviously filled in for Brody um, this weekend at Bathurst in the the Erebus car. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's not good for the sport. It's not a good look when when you know your two title combatants from last year, both in you know, Shane and Brody, aren't on the grid for round one. Um, it's drawing a bit of a negative light to the sport. Um, and we've seen that with the amount of sponsors that have decided to leave Erebus as well. Um, and they're obviously not, you know, leaving Erebus because they're done with motorsport. We see Coca-Cola has made a probably an even bigger investment in sponsoring a whole bunch of cars and people, especially into Super 2. Um, so, yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, while... <laughs> While Todd finally gets to go to a, a car that's probably going to be consistent and reliable and, and, and speedy, he's going there while the team is basically imploding. Yeah, there's there's a lot of layers to it and it is definitely messy. And, I mean, I, I don't know whether you saw I got involved in, in a discussion with the natives on Speed Cafe over the issue during the Christmas break. It ended up being something like 65 responses between different people um, because for whatever reason... Um, how can I put this? So I find it really fascinating how drivers like Scott McLaughlin and SVG felt the need to remark and be a spokesperson for Brody on the issue when if they did or if they didn't know what the outcome was, it really has nothing to do with them. You're racing in America, concentrate on America. If I wanted to be an asshole, right, I could turn around and say, Scotty, you've been in America, you're with Penske, you haven't won a, a, an IndyCar title. You haven't come close to winning the Indy 500, right? You've been there long enough in a, in a top top tier team. Maybe focus your energies on actually doing that, right? Rather than the shit that's going on down here, which doesn't concern you anymore, right? Why do you feel the need to be a spokesperson and then try and throw supercars under the bus? SVG, well, we know that he's had a, a rod for supercars back now in the last 12 months. So, of course, can't help himself, but he's also a good mate with Brody too. So you kind of understand all that sort of stuff. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, it's an issue between driver and team. That's it. There's two sides to the story, right? Whether it's right or whether it's wrong. But to have people like your Mark Addertons and like all of your... Peter Addertons. Um, sorry, Peter Addison. Mark Addertons, I think his brother or something. Anyway, Peter Addison, to then come out and then say it's supercar's responsibility to actually make a statement. Is it? I don't think so. You know, like it's, you know, they've come out and they get bashed from pillar to post. They've come out, they've said they've been in consultation with the team to try and facilitate some sort of mediation. But at the end of the day, it's an issue between team and and driver because Brody's employed by Erebus. He's not employed by supercars, right? Erebus are a franchise technically that's part of supercars. They can come and go whenever they want. So I, I just think, People like Adderton, et cetera, you know, when, when they come out and they talk about driver welfare and all that sort of stuff, yep, that's great. But you're only doing it because Brody's actually a Boost Mobile endorsed athlete and he's realistically going to be the only driver that's actually going to give you the forefront of sponsorship each year because of who he is, right? Because I'll tell you who his other drivers are. James Courtney, Richie Stanaway, uh, Macaulay Jones, and then there was uh, Brody. So he's got three others, right? Has he he's helped Richie get back, give him that tick? Has he been endorsing JC? Has he been endorsing Macaulay when Macaulay's been bashed from pillar to post on social media repeatedly by all the, all the rock apes that are out there on, on all the Fiat supercar sites because his father owns the team and he's been more in the back portion of the field, right? When are you worried about the mental health of that kid, right, and his welfare? But it's all about Brody, 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 because Brody's going to be endorsing boosts right at the front, right? Yeah, I think. Then he talks about yeah. Then he talks about stopping sponsorship for the Gold Coast uh, event, right? Who's now sponsoring pole position for Viet Supercars on the weekend? Boost Mobile, five thousand dollars per pole position, right? And there's Addison there going, 
right? Handing out posters and all that, and checks and all that sort of stuff. So you either, are you against supercars or are you with supercars, right? And are you looking after Brody's welfare, right? And why are you being his spokesperson, even though you're sponsoring him, when it really has nothing to do with him in the first place? Like all this sort of stuff just colludes and pollutes the sport. It doesn't do it any favours. It doesn't do him any favours because people then start to turn around and say, mate, you're a fucking joke. I think you've got to look further back than that, though. Like, if, if it's, it's only if you compare what what gets said with Macaulay Jones online, it's not really, you know, it's just keyboard warriors, right? But the fact that it, the the situation with Brody has blown up into epic proportions and there's so many questions as to why, that's why I feel like Peter's had to go into bat and say, like, look, it's it's you've got to think about Brody and his mental health and all that sort of stuff because you don't you know you don't see the front page of the newspaper saying Macaulay Jones is only in V8 supercars because his dad owns the team. That's not a headline that's coming out. That's not what Speed Cafe are writing. That's not what Motorsport.com's writing. It's not what us at Negative Canberra are saying. You know, Macaulay Jones doesn't deserve a seat because it's he's only there because his dad owns the team. That's that's mm. not the headlines that are being spoken. So to have it going so public and so viral, I think that's where the mental health side of things comes in, um, which I can understand. Like I feel that mm. if I was an elite athlete at that level I and I knew more of the story than what the media was letting on, it, it, it's painting Brody as the bad guy. And I don't think that's the case. Well, I mean, I know for sure that it's not the case. Um, hmm. So I think that's where the need to have some support from public figures has come into it. Um, hmm. And, you know, I mean, I would do the same thing as well. If I was Peter Adderton, I would probably have pulled my sponsorship of naming rights for a major race and the investment that I'm giving to that race meeting. Like, how much money does it cost to have naming rights for a V8 supercars round? Do we know? Um, and I could probably get the same exposure for giving a driver, a particular driver who gets to qualify on pole, a cash bonus. I get the same exposure. I've got the boost pole award versus having one race meeting where I spend probably 10 times as much money over the course of what I'm going to spend this year and giving out a pole award. So Peter's a pretty smart guy. I, um, I probably would have done the same thing to be fair. So I can't, I can't sit here and and uh, say that I'm on on the same side as you there. Oh look, I, I I'm not discrediting his ability to run a business. See, I've I've listened to him speak, and yeah, he's got his head switched on. He's got an empire there. He knows what he's doing. It's not about that. I just think to myself, there's been some massive blues that he's made in terms of decisions in in supercars in the last twelve months. I mean, who buys a race car? without having a race team confirmed on the grid for starters and then have to get the money refunded halfway through the year with Triple Eight. But why would you do that? Yeah, how do we know that that was the full conversation? How do we know there were not more conversations that it was like a 90, 95% done deal and then the, the pin was pulled at the last minute. So, you know, he wanted to be he wanted to be ready for round one. He knew the time was the time was uh, running out, um, wanted to be ready to go when the time came. Um yeah, who knows? But uh, mm. yeah, I mean, like, look, like I said, I, I don't think I don't think pulling out of the sponsorship of the Boost Gold Coast Five Hundred and then sponsoring the Pole Award is contradictory in his um, his messaging. I don't think he's mm. supporting supercars with the Pole Award. I think he's supporting the drivers of supercars with the Pole Award. Knowing what he'd be like, that's probably exactly what his response would be. So I think you're right on the money with that one. I just think the way the whole thing's busy. I mean, look, even with Erebus, like at the end of the day, you're going to stop the hemorrhaging, being quiet about it, especially when your reputation's been put at great risk or all, all the way up and down pit lane, but also in the general public. Just come clean and explain your side of the story without shadow boxing. Now, if there's been legal ramifications that they've had to put the clamps on each other and all that sort of stuff, I get all that. But all this thing could have been put to bed a long, long time ago if either party or both of them actually came clean on the matter and said, look, even if they didn't reveal all of the story, we've had a major disagreement. We haven't been able to come to terms with trying to patch this up. We're in the midst of discussions with going our separate ways. 
It's been a great experience, won the championship. Thank us for the memories and we'll just try and come to a resolution and move on. And you know what? 95% of what happened would have, wouldn't have actually eventuated. But I don't think that's like, the case. Like, like, I don't yeah. think they have come to an agreement to split ways. No, I they think, haven't. I think they they're haven't. still hoping that Brody turns around and decides to come race cars again. But um, yeah, I think you know, I can't see that. Too many, too many waters have gone under those bridges. A huge thank you goes out to our podium partner, Procast Race Centre, and our incredible sponsors. Your partnership allows us to continue bringing you this show and dive deeper into the world of motorsports. If your business adds value to the motorsport community, get in touch with us to become a negative camber partner. Time to discover more than just a track. It's time to find your racing family at Procarts Race Centre. We're more than a racing facility. We're a community of enthusiasts bound by our shared love for motorsport. What sets us apart? Our commitment to inclusivity. We're breaking barriers, welcoming rookies and pros alike to experience the thrill of racing. With our low investment pathways into karting, we're paving the way for the next generation of racers. Whether you're a seasoned racer seeking camaraderie or a beginner eager to learn, Procast Race Centre is your home. Join our vibrant community, feel the passion and share the rush of victory with friends who share your passion. Visit procartsracecentre.com.au or pop in for a chat at 30 Research Road, Paraka. Procarts Race Centre, fueling your passion, igniting your potential. But anyway, there was yeah. um, there was a race or two this weekend. There was, yes. And you know what? To Todd's credit, absolutely fantastic job considering the circumstances, the short time frame. You know, he signed with Erebus to be an endurance driver. That was kind of the vibe that we like. We knew he'd got an enduro seat when we saw him at the 500, just didn't know who it was. Mm -hmm. And then it came out that it was with Erebus. So before all this Brody stuff came out, you think kind of think to yourself, wow, he's in a box seat. He's going to team up with Jack LeBrock. He's got a front-running car, amazing opportunity, and then he's thrust in having a crack at, at Bathurst. And to his credit, a solid, solid drive, you know, fantastic. And it was just really a pity today. They had clutch issues right from the start, and then yesterday they had a fuel filler issue where he lost seven seconds in the pits, and that's what dropped him down the order. Otherwise, he should have finished top five yesterday as well. So um, what I did come uh, – so I managed to watch both races – um and do you know what i didn't miss svg you know i you know the the championship and the way the racing was done the um i guess the feeling that you got watching the tv in pit lane was that you've got fresh young blood uh it's a very very open championship this year uh red bull or triple eight were arguably the class of the field but walkinshaw andretti united via Chas mostert gave them a damn good run for their money, which didn't happen last year. And there's been a significant improvement between the equality of both cars, even if, um, well, and that's the thing. So Chaz came out yesterday saying that there was still a discrepancy in the speed traps. Today, it's been revealed that Dick Johnson Racing actually provided Walkinshaw and Andretti United with their straight line speed data. And there was only a couple of Ks difference between the top line Chevys, which are the Red Bulls, and the DJR cars in a straight line. So it wasn't perfect, but it was a lot closer than what, uh, what had come to bear. So what has it's turned out, there's been some setup differences between the way Walkinshaw set up their car versus the rest of the field because Chaz across the top in the Mustang was um, unbelievable. He'd make up about a half a second with the lap time across any, uh, over anyone else across the top, pretty much from Skyline all the way through to Forest Elbow, just dynamic. But uh, Brock Feeney, Will Brown, Chaz Mostert finished first, second, and third in race one yesterday. And then Will, Chaz, and Brock finished first, second, and third today, with Chaz actually leading majority of that race. And it wasn't until really the final pit stop where Walkinshaw uh, put in eight seconds worth of more fuel compared to Will Brown in the previous stop, but then also had a mix-up on the front right, uh, front right uh, with, the, uh, with the wheel gun. That, that's when the race turned on its head and changed otherwise really Chaz should have won today so yeah overall it was a great uh, i actually thought it was quite a solid round one yesterday's race was a bit more of a procession with red bull but or the opening race of the season is always a bit of a hit and miss 
today was a lot more competitive as teams started to get their head around the new aerodynamic settings, especially in the Ford camp. Yeah, well, like, haven't had a chance to sit back and watch the racing yet, but, um, yeah, just echo your thoughts on on Todd. I've just looked at the results and he was, you know, four-tenths better than Jack LeBrock today um, over their best laps. And, unfortunately, like you said, with the clutch issue, that would have been hard to manage and he finished just behind him. Um, made the top 10 shootout yesterday, ultimately started 7th and then finished 11th. And uh, like I said, with that pit stop mistake, they probably would have been on for almost a podium even. Uh, they would have been close to that. So, um, yeah, uh, comes out of the, the weekend 13th in the championship, which is which is a good start, a solid foundation hmm. if he gets another round to build upon. And when you're 7 tenths of a second a lap faster than your more fancied teammate yesterday and then 4 tenths faster today, while you're driving around the clutch issue, um, it's a pretty big, pretty good shot in the arm for for your chances. Yeah, look, they they had a brief chat with Barry um, yesterday, Barry Ryan, and he actually uh, remarked he didn't actually realise how good Todd was until he was actually working with him up close this weekend. So now Barry worked with Todd previously as his, as his engineer, and I think in the Formula Ford days, if I remember correctly. Um, so to see his evolution as a driver, oh, what, 10 years apart, something roughly around that, mm-hmm. that sort of time frame, is, you know, is a testament to Todd. But it also just shows what I suppose we've all known really is that the talent's there. He just needed the right opportunity to actually show it. And so, you know, whilst you want to have the reigning champion back on the grid, selfishly, I'd love to see Todd stay in Erebus all season. Me too. He's earned the right. As far as I'm concerned. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah. He just needs a, a good chance to prove himself in a, a consistent and, and competitive package. Hmm. And I think um given the fact that Jack and Todd have to learn the setup of the Camaro, but also how the cars are actually set up with Erebus uh, in as well, I actually think they'll get better as the season goes on. I really do. Providing that they're all they stay the same. Yeah, I, so, I do agree. Yeah. Do I see it as a title? Probably not, but stranger things have happened. Todd's certainly capable of doing it. And he'll get a lot of miles this year, even racing the Trans Am as well. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And um, yeah. you did touch on your good friend SVG there, and I think it's probably uh, a good time to take note and bring some light to his outstanding achievement in his um, second only oval Xfinity race um, held at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Uh, this morning, our time, where he finished a very, very credible third after only seeing the track for the first time in qualifying yesterday morning, Friday morning, uh, Friday morning, Saturday morning, our time. Um, a very, very strong oval result in in the NASCAR for someone who hasn't done much oval racing and, and didn't get a lot of time to see the track. Yeah, look, credit where credit is due. Uh, at the end of the day, I think tactically they they had done something in the pits with about 10 or 15 to go, which helped. Um, I wasn't a fan of what happened in the ARCA race the previous week at Daytona. I think how his team managed that situation was very, very disappointing, to be honest. And then, I mean, he made it up He made up for it in the Xfinity race and obviously this week as well. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, he, they made a tactical blunder. He didn't qualify to make the, uh, the Daytona ARCA race and then his team um, pretty much pull a... Well, I wouldn't say a Swifty. I don't know what, how you describe it, but basically the driver that qualified 17th in their team got told to step aside so they could give SVG a start. And I guess Karma came back to bite him on the backside because he was out within the first four laps of the race. And for me, you and I had a sort of chat about it um, last week offline, and I kind of think to myself, you know what? He's got to earn the right. My opinion is this. You've got to earn the right to race. And if you make a mistake and it results in you not qualifying or not making the cutoff and, and that type of thing, well, guess what? Bad luck, right? I'd be mortified if I was his teammate and be, I've done the right thing. I've qualified 17th. I've got us in the mid pack, great position. And then to be asked to step aside and sacrifice my race to let him just get some Ks on there. To me, that's shit. What you've uh, also got care. to remember it's though, shit. is that a lot of these guys are racing for paychecks. Like, mm start and park is a thing like they literally qualify to start the race so that they can do one lap three laps four laps you know if in chances that there might be a wreck in the first few laps and then park Mm. their car because the prize money for actually starting a race is quite significant in america not like here so 
I mean, if I qualified for a race that's notorious for having massive, massive wrecks and someone came up to me and said, hey, we give you more than the money that it costs if you or the money that you'll receive if you finish last in this race and you get to go home with a straight car, I'll probably take it. Like imagine, imagine he doesn't take it and he gets in a wreck, writes off a car, he's $200,000 in the hole. He's going to be pretty upset with himself, but he's maybe just made his racing budget for the rest of the year off of that one decision. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, he could have said no. Look, there's that side of it, and it's it's compelling on that front, especially if he's funding the drive or if he's got financial responsibility for that well, car. Definitely like, tell me that know. he's definitely not being paid in ARCA to field that car. He is paying yeah. out of his own back pocket or his sponsors are paying out of their own back pocket to have that car start that race. Which, you know, it would be like half the field in Super 2, let's say if we had to relate it into Australian terms, where they fund their own drive. The whole field. No, no one in Super 2 is being paid. Oh, outside of the Tickford guys or, or uh, Triple H. They, sure. they, would be bringing, they will be bringing budget to a team. Yeah. They, okay. they wouldn't be being... Like Brad Vord is not being paid to race for Tickford in Super 2. Hmm. Yeah. Well, if, yeah, actually you'd be right on that because I did catch up with... Um, a guy that used to be on the spanners for a guy that used to race in Tickford uh, in Super 2, and they had actually bought the car to race for Tickford at that time. So on that front, yes. My question is this. What's the point of being a freaking racing driver if money is going to dictate whether you choose to race or not, when the whole point is getting out there to race money, and to be competitive? Money dictates whether we race or not every single weekend. Like I know that but it that takes guy, away the essence of the sport. You take you take into account that guy's thinking decisions. Can they might not have even had a budget to race outside of Daytona? They might have been hanging all of their hopes and dreams on achieving some sort of miracle result at Daytona to f- help fund their next race, to help fund the race after that. Someone's walked up to them and said, "We'll do it for you. Here's the money. You get to race the rest of the year." You just have to say that you've got a mechanical problem so SVG can start the race. He gets to race another 30 race meetings this year because of that one decision. Whereas he mm. could have been caught in, he might not have, like I said, he might not even have had the budget to go past Daytona, let alone if he wrecked the car and has to find a new engine, a new chassis, mm. new panel work, new uprights, new wheels, new rims. He, he's he's ruined. So... Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a so lot when of, you put, it's not as easy as just saying, hey, I know I'm paying you to race, but here's another 10 grand to say you're sick. That that That's not the same mm. sort of deal. See, when you put it like that and you think about it and you put yourself in the position of a driver that needs the money, makes perfect sense. You take it, you walk away with an undamaged car, that's all good. I completely understand that. And I wasn't even aware that ARC was actually set up like that. I just actually thought it was a feeder category to Xfinity, which then it's a feeder category to NASCAR. I mean, it which, is. You know. It is, but at the same time, like no one's being paid to race ARCA. Mm. No, no, mm. no one team in ARCA is saying, hey, we're going to give you $200,000 this year to come and race our cars and you don't have to pay a cent. That's not the deal. Yeah. They're either okay. taking a, the drivers are either taking a percentage of the winnings and that's their, that's their job, mm. right? or they've come with money, they also have a day job, or maybe they don't, but they've come with money to say, we're going to buy that seat. Yeah. There's just something about it, though, in terms of how that whole setup works. It just doesn't sit right with me. I don't know what it is, man. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe I I don't know. I I just can't get my head around the fact. You don't like a SVG. That's (laughs) that's what it is. No, you know, uh, you know what? You know what I don't like about it? I did not like the conduct that he had in terms of the way he treated the Supercars Championship last year and how he invariably pissed on the sport that made him. That's what I don't like, right? And the fact that he made it all about him, right? And that's what it was all about. And the fact that he didn't want to take accountability for his conduct and his actions from Newcastle from round one 
right? And then from the, when he got pulled up, not only by Mark Scaife, because everyone wanted to pull uh, pull dirt on the great man for calling him out, but also Garth Tander called him out too. His own teammate from Bathurst for the last two Bathurst victories and pretty much said, SVG, your conduct is shit, right? You need to pull your socks up. You're a reigning champion. You need to be better than that. I actually think, you know what? The greats of the sport hold the, the current youth accountable or the current drivers accountable right because they're the torchbearers i actually applauded that i thought it was fantastic right but everyone else wanted to get on the on, on svg's uh back and say because they're all anti scafe brigade right you told me you're going to argue with the six-time bathurst champion five-time touring car champion two-time gold time mark scafe's accolades are better than the whole grid combined in supercars and interest right the guy's got to write and reply and so I think his whole conduct for the rest of the year, I've never seen so many steering column brake issues, gearbox issues out of one car coming out of triple eight out of a 197 over the course of the last 12 months. His conduct was shit, 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 shit. All right. right. Settle and down. So therefore, <laughs> Settle down over there. Yeah. You're going so hard. Hey, your desk on. is dropping. Oh, no, it was actually lifted. <laughs> <laughs> we're unfiltered here, mate. We're unfiltered. This is what I like because our natural voice now. So, no. I have respect for his, his driving record. You know, um, didn't mind the way he raced, even though he pushed the limits in terms of conduct. That's fine. But his attitude last year in terms of how he conducted it was it was really, really disappointing. And there's many down the pit lane that reflect that view on the lowdown. You and I both know this. So, um, you know, sincerely though, I wish him the best and I hope he does make it in NASCAR because it's good for, it, it's good for supercars and it's good for the drivers like Brody and like maybe Cam or like anyone else that has aspirations to America, if he can crack it and show what, we can, what we've got down here is good enough to take on the Yanks in their own game, I stand back and applaud, right? Do it the right way, conduct yourself in the right manner, don't be a tool, and you'll be all good. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, um, yeah, now there's a break for four weeks until we get to the Melbourne Grand Prix and supercars. That's the only thing I think that's really missing is they need more races. 12 is okay. They need at least three or four more. At least. At least. At least. You know. But then, yeah, like, like we've said, there's just not that level of track. They'd run out of tracks. They'd have to go back to revisit tracks. And I don't think that's as exciting as, as a calendar that visits different tracks all the time. Well, do, don't NASCAR revisit some of their tracks too? Though? Yeah, they go... Um, go to every track twice basically but uh it's a different format each time so that would be the way that you know supercars would have to um have to manage it well speaking of nascar um what did happen at daytona and what's been happening at atlanta because that's that race is going to be overnight i believe yep and i'm glad that you think i've had uh more than enough time to to catch up on that (laughs) No, it's a Daytona. Well, uh, Willie Byron uh, took the win. Um, they went into overtime, and uh, it was again a crash coming to start the final lap. But they just crossed the start finish line, so it was close between him and his teammate Alex Bowman um, in the in the Cup Series. Um, but yeah, the Willie Byron was just in front, um, so they gave him the win. Um, they had Bowman second, Chris Bell third. Corey LaJoey, fourth, Bubba Wallace, fifth, Bubba, wow, already. AJ Ormendinger, uh, John Nemechek in seventh, uh, Eric Jones, eighth, Noah Gragson, ninth, and Chase Briscoe rounding at the top 10. Our boy, uh, our boy Carl Larson in 11th as well. So, yeah. Um, when did they actually do that? It was on the 18th of February. So was that, was that done all at night time? Because uh, I know was, they had weather delays. Yeah, it was on uh, the Monday, the 18th of February. So I think that was Tuesday morning, our time. And they ran the okay. cup race first and then ran the Xfinity race like directly after it. So racing finished at something like 11.30 p.m. or 12, 12 midnight um, their time. Um, so, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty interesting uh, yeah, old afternoon. And, Made for a good um, good Tuesday morning at, at my work. I mean, was it Tuesday or it might have been, might have been Monday? Been no, I think it was Monday. I think yeah. it was was on Monday, 17th of uh, February, their time. Um, but yeah, made a good Monday morning. Got to watch two NASCAR races back to back and then my workday was nearly finished. So it was pretty good. <laughs> Could you imagine like 
six, seven hours of NASCAR sitting on the track at Daytona. Just joy, joy. I could, could be great fun. It's on my bucket list. Yeah. Like missed it by two days when I went to Miami, but still got to get there. It's on my bucket list. It's just going to be another another level. I'd love to go for the whole month of um, month of February Daytona sort of fest, I guess, with the the twenty four hour then. Two weeks later, the NASCARs, and then this weekend, I think they have the um, Supercross. Um, mm-hmm. So it would be yeah, super cool to, to go and see all that stuff. But uh, yeah. I love seeing the video footage of people that take the video recording uh, at the start of the NASCAR race and up against the wall. Just that speed. I mean, to see that in the flesh, to hear the noise, would just be magic. Yeah. You know, that would be cool to go to Daytona. I'd love to go to Daytona. 100%. Um, Wear my old school Dale Earnhardt gear, <laughs> mixing with the locals. The Intimidator. <laughs> so, yeah. I was thinking of actually doing that as my helmet too, but everyone else has got black helmets and it's like, well, I'm the farthest thing from Dale Earnhardt. Yeah. So why would I want to do that? Yeah. So you're still pretty far <laughs> from Mark Scaife too, you know, except, yeah, How you dare. probably spend as much time driving cars as Mark Scaife does at the moment. I know, I know. But um, I have created that by, well, it's been partly by opportunism with houses and uh, marathon training and stuff, but it's been delayed. So hopefully we're we're uh, we're racing or out on the track at least testing by the end of uh, I'd probably say early to mid March at this stage. So yes, I will be back, but um, it's likely going to be sort of after around that Easter period that we'll start to hit the track again. So um, yeah, we'll get there. But um, one thing about the karting season I love is that you've got twelve months to get your you get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have one race. Speaking of carts, all right. So you're at the AKC. What was it like? What was the general vibe? A lot of those drivers hadn't been to the uh, revised Southerns, so you can be as open and as honest as you want. Don't play the politically correct. Oh, they thought the track was great. I want, I want the full, I want the full Monty because you were there and I wasn't. I just saw results. Yeah, I mean, like the atmosphere was great. Tents and marquees and carts and four hundred carts and spectators lining the fence ten deep, and it was pretty pretty solid atmosphere. I'd like to. I wish I'd got a chance to walk around a bit more and just try and put a bit of a try and get a bit of a gauge as to how many people were there as like random spectators versus people that were there as family um because the place looked busy like every time you went into the canteen the thing was pumping the new hill um for for viewing at the end of the straight was pumping like every time i was standing on the fence watching there was it just looked like it was absolutely packed up on the hill um all the grandstands were full every race um the pit area was full every race the new um the new grandstand, the new container grandstand on the sweeper was full every race. Um, so it was it was a pumping, pumping little atmosphere, which was killer. Um, what did people think of the track? If you ask the guys in my team, the ones that had been to the old track didn't like it. The ones mm-hmm. that hadn't experienced Bolivar before was sort of 50-50. Um, yep. They didn't. They weren't the biggest fans of the new section. Um, they thought it was a bit clumsy. Um, from turn three onwards, or are we talking from uh, like flip flop? What was uh, the old lake field? More, more so, um, the flip flop than anything else. They thought it was a bit clumsy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also just the fact that there was no no chance to stretch your legs in that area and try and set up a passing maneuver. Like it was like. Once you came through turn three, you were done. Like that was it. There wasn't much to do. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, um, the class, the guys that were racing for us were racing in pretty high, you know, high spots. So they were um, being driven hard. So they, you know, the guys in front of them knew where to block and and knew how to make it hard to pass into turn four. So yeah, that was probably split fifty fifty. Um, but yeah, it was great atmosphere. Driving standards was atrocious yesterday, mostly into into today as well. Like the racing was not amazing. Um, some blowout victories, um, some local victories, which was good. Um, some really good performances from the likes of Josh Elliston and Noah Enright and even Oshan Colangelo. Um, with a, with podiums, Josh won KA3 Senior. Noah got second in KA3 Junior and Oshan was third in KA2. 
Uh, but mm. yeah, it's just it was just good to see Bolivar at that level again, just with 400 go karts on track. Um, a, a nice, decent rubber line appearing over the weekend. Um, yeah, just good to just good to see it. Was there like an atomic cloud above the track of two stroke fumes? Basically, yeah. Yeah, 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 basically yeah. every every morning, um, <laughs> and the start of every race. Obviously, there was then everyone's loaded up and, and super rich. Um, yeah, it was uh, mm. it was quite a quite a nice smell to spend my day in. Yeah, enough to make you high, I guess. Too. Can I? Uh, uh, you know what? Probably good segue that you touched on, it, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, Oceana Noah. I, I thought Noah's performance, and it was so unlucky to uh, to. I guess fall three tenths short of of a breakthrough win. I'm not sure whether he's run an AKC round before, and if he hasn't, or if he has, then you know props. But um, I believe this would have been the first one. Just uh, the performance that he put on over the whole weekend, considering the budget that they run up against the likes of the J and D team that ultimately took the prize with um, Jack Swichuk. I think you know what props to him and and to Simon and, and to the family as well for putting together. Uh, an overall package that was just simply outstanding. He's clearly at one with the Tony Kart now. The engine package that they're running is exemplary. I mean, we we saw what sort of horsepower that that thing was creating when we were uh, seeing footage of him going down the main straight at Mount Gambier, which is probably the closest straight that resembles Bolivar, and that thing was quick. And I just think that the overall driving was was absolutely sensational. So, I mean... It, He's clearly done a lot of our laps of Bolivar and is well prepared, but he's also at one with his go kart as well. And so, as an overall package, I think, you know, if they can replicate that sort of form across the whole season, he's in with a genuine chance of taking out the AKC in in, in his class. But then Oceana as well. I mean, she's also a, a, an amazing talent. I've been saying this for the last two or three years. To be the first girl to actually take a, a heat win in KA two in the history of the AKC is something that one they can never take away from her but also vindicates what i've also been saying is that is she's always been running under budget and under resourced and being part of a team that's clearly got the budget but also with a decent cart underneath her she's more than capable of taking it to you know more experienced drivers in that in that class or she has the potential herself to potentially win an akc title as well in ka2 Josh Elliston's got that capability as well through TD Racing as well. So I think those three drivers in particular stand out. I mean, obviously it's Sullins. It's if you if you if you can't get your act together at the track that you race at the most, then there's a problem. But uh, at the same token, um, they were three standouts for me over the course of the weekend. Yeah, for sure, hundred um, percent. Like I said, home track advantage. So uh, at least they used it used it wisely. Like they've done a million laps around there. They've been at the track every time that I've been out there recently. So. Um, yeah, to me, not so much of a surprise to see them at the front. Um, Josh's performance was absolutely outstanding in KA3. Like, I don't think he dropped a, a, a point all weekend. So, um, good start to his championship. Same with Noah's, um, same with Oceans. They've just gave, given themselves a solid foundation to build upon now as they head to Pakapanyal. Um, Noah's done a few AKC rounds before. He's been on the podium at AKC before. Um, so, he's he's... Got to just adapt to new tracks now. That's going to be his biggest challenge um, is adapting to new tracks because I don't think he's going to have the opportunity to go and practice on some of these Eastern State tracks as much as some of the other guys and girls are. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the season plays out, but I'll be at every round. So uh, it'll be it'll be good to keep an eye on these South Australian competitors. Well, they've covered any of the tracks that are in this year's AKC event through, say, Big Country Series when they raced it last year, perhaps? Nope. No? No. No. Okay. Yep. So that'll be the test. Yep. Really? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, I've got to say, I mean, on the outset, you'd say, you know, Patrizzi Corsa's performance was a little bit of a letdown. But when you take into consideration that they were building carts that had only just arrived in the country about four or five days before they had to drive all the way down from Queensland, given the rush and the pressure to actually make that deadline, um, I think they'll bounce back with a bit of a vengeance over the coming rounds. I don't think that's an excuse, really. I know people that were building carts and brand new carts on the day that ended up, you know, on, on Wednesday morning and Wednesday afternoon, they were building new carts and they still performed at quite a high level. So I think Patrizzi have got a, a new team. They've got some fresh faces. Um, 
they got some young faces in there. Um, maybe they just uh, just missed the mark with uh, with their qualifying, their performance, the way they manage their weekend. Um, they'll go they'll go back and and do some homework and and come come back stronger. But I don't think it's got anything to do with how they were building carts during the week. Um, yeah, like I said. Their, the drivers need to perform on the day, and it's got nothing to do with with whether the cart's being built the night before or not. We we built a, we, mm-hmm. we built a new cart for uh, for our cadet driver in between heat races, and he came out and went from thirtieth to fifth in the next race. So, um, yeah, I think it's more about the preparation of the driver rather than the than uh, as long as the cart's got four wheels and an engine on it, it should be able to be driven hard. Mm. You know, it was really good for me to see CRG dominating in the KZ. <laughs> It wasn't for I think um, who was it the guy that got pole I can't remember his name Reese Cohen um, Reese Cohen and I think he was what top two top three and then retired or had a mechanical or something like that in the final towards the end yeah so definitely yeah. didn't have a mechanical well, oh tell me what happened I know he uh, went for a move at the end of the straight and it didn't come off oh no are you serious yeah was it for the lead or yep, for, for the lead. podium not for the lead oh man. Oh, CRG proved it was fast. That's all I'm, I'm happy with that. CRG, DR, same thing. Red, orange, same, 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 same. If you say so. So, I do say so. <laughs> but you never know. You know what's going to happen next year? CS55 is just going to roll out on the track. Not mine. Not mine. Um, so, what happens when you buy a house? That's out. That's put to the back burner for a while. But uh, a CS55 will win around next year. Don't know which class, but it will be. Because there'll be, a, there'll be a fleet of them. A fleet of them. Because they're that good. CS55 to, uh, OTK, that's where it's at. Um, I think that's it. I think we've we're done for the first week. We're nearly an hour and a half. We managed to sort of push it out. It's like the old days, man. You managed to push Commercial it out. Free I've, I've managed SV, to keep my SVG eyes Brody open. Waffle. I've had managed to keep my <laughs> eyes open for longer than than we needed. Well, you know what? I've got to say, I'll give credit to you because you did a far better job doing that than what you did last year when we were both pushing the midnight lamp doing the four-stroke uh, endurance race preview. We were both like, yeah, all right. Let's do <laughs> nah. But um, when's our next one? Are we, are we doing it fortnightly again? What, what's yeah, we'll probably be back in two weeks, I guess. Or, uh, yeah, we'll see We'll see what comes up between now and Saudi Arabia Grand Prix. We we'll, might jump on and do a half-hour de- debrief of the Bahrain Grand Prix. But, um, yeah, yeah but that's the yeah. freedom that we've got. We can pick and choose when we want to do them because – yeah, we're 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 out here doing it ourselves. Yes, I know. We just the only thing I miss is that that face to face, like in person interaction, like you know, you and I throwing cream puffs at each other, literally over a desk or something like that. So, metaphorically speaking, so don't take it literally. <laughs> right. Maybe I'll start the next show wearing my helmet. It'll probably be the only action it will see up until I actually <laughs> go on it. track. It might make it might be a better it. better look for the YouTube video. Well, I've always, I even tell my clients uh, when I, my work job during the day that I have a face for radio. That's why they only hear me over the phone. <laughs> so I will live up, I will live up to that mantra quite comfortably. But uh, mate, we're back and um, let's hope uh, we, uh, we're out onto the airwaves this week and that um, everyone likes this new look. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you all in, in a fortnight's time with uh, plenty to discuss in the world of Rosewall. Good night. You've reached the checkered flag of another episode of Negative Camber the Motorsport Show, proudly brought to you by Pro Karts Race Centre. A huge thank you to you, our incredible listeners. Your support and passion for motorsports fuels our enthusiasm to bring you the latest results, analysis and interviews from the racing world. Keep that FOMO at bay by subscribing to Negative Camber on your favourite podcast platform. We'd also love it if you could leave us a review and share the show with your fellow racing enthusiasts. Your feedback and support mean the world to us. Remember, Negative Camber is more than just a podcast. We're a community of dedicated fans who live and breathe motorsports. Follow us on socials, join us on our website, negativecamber.co, and be sure to subscribe to the Negative Camber Club for access to exclusive content, episode previews, and special deals from our amazing partners. Until next time... Stay fueled with passion, embrace the negative camber, and keep chasing those podium finishes.